About four weeks ago, I decided to get serious about my training for the Hurtwood 50k ultramarathon that I ran just this Sunday. The idea was to focus heavily on lots of distance running, some serious weight loss, proper dedication to the goal of smashing my previous time from right back in 2019. But then I stopped and thought about it and I realized two things. Firstly, is that really what my channel's about? Where the message is a sensible-ish amount of training exercise is all you need to elevate yourself to being above average and that that simply obtainable achievement is enough to yield real satisfaction without the need for massive lifestyle sacrifices, be that excessive time spent in the gym or depriving yourself of foods you enjoy. And no, this isn't just about me not wanting to skip donuts for four weeks. And secondly, I didn't want to skip donuts for four weeks. So this is the start of Sunday's race that I had trained quite gently for and not worried about diet too much to the extent that I was a smidge under 101 kilos on race day. And in the world of endurance runners, if the scales show that way, you've probably got two of them on there at once. So I was heavier than I had been in a while, but it didn't matter because I was gonna just trust in the five things that I've always done to allow me as a larger than normal runner to plod along just fine and be happily above average despite weighing a bit more than average. And as I recap on the race for you, I'll go through those five things. You might find them useful, even if you aren't a large runner yourself, they'll hopefully benefit anybody looking to run far and enjoy it. So first, a bit about this run and my history with it. Hurtwood 50, 50K ultramarathon in Dorking, Surrey, 95% off-road through beautiful woodland countryside, well over 4,000 feet of climbing. In 2019, I'd run my first ever 50K along the River Thames, to the side of it at least. Dead flat, very boring, but I got the bug, and so I signed up for the Hurtwood 50 at the end of that year. That then became my second 50K, did it in six hours, two minutes. Interesting, at that point, I'd never run further than about 20K apart from those two runs. And not a lot has changed since. I mostly do 10Ks, a couple of half marathons a year, never run a full marathon race, have done some 20 mile mountain races in Wales with the dog, and I did a 100K race a few months back, but I nearly died, so ignore that. This is stupid, why would anyone want to do this? This is nuts. There's no one here, just in a field. So in a nutshell, I run plenty of 10s, I dabble in longer distance stuff, but without specifically preparing for them as such. Also, you'll know if you watch the channel. I lift weights a little bit, I cycle, obstacle course running, you get the idea. I'm not a classic ultra marathon runner, no beard, not a flapjack in sight. Okay, my first heavy runner tip. Good kit, and by the way, this is only a kilometer into this run and we are off-road already. It's a brilliant course, and this guy in front of me wearing a Solomon vest, gonna come back to those in a second. So kit, from my motorcycle adventure days, I learned I'd rather lug something about that I don't then need than travel light and then be without it when I want it in the middle of the desert when it's all going south. So I'll happily carry stuff, even if most others aren't. Here, because of the distance, everyone's got a backpack with gear. But for example, Nixon and I, we ran a 10K race a couple of weeks back, and I carried a bit of kit on that that most other runners wouldn't have been bothering with. By the way, 17th out of 258, go Nixon. So what am I carrying here? Well, first of all, lubricant. If you're bigger than most, you have a need for lubricant that goes beyond the norm. I was way over 300 pounds when I started running. That is a lot of jiggly, sweaty flesh. You learn fast what body parts are rubbing, and if you forget to lubricate them and then jump in a hot shower afterwards, you do not forget again. I'm no longer that heavy, but I'm still a big lump. So I carry lube so if something gets sore mid-race, I can fix it on the move. I put it in these, these little silicon travel pot things that I stole from my wife. Along similar lines, I carry a few bits of first aid, plasters for blisters, a couple of painkillers. This race had a mandatory first aid kit requirement, but I carry some basics anyway. Actually, a really good example, about 20K into this run, because of the cold, biting wind, to dry my sweat super quick, I didn't realize I was getting rubbing of salt underneath my arms. But I thought I did notice it was too late for lubricant, so I was able to stick a couple of plasters on there instead, rather than running along with my arms out here. Mental note, lubricate arms next time. Also, when it's cold, I carry a long sleeve top. The bigger you are, the harder it is to regulate temperature. Surface area does not go up linear to size. And as humans who regulate through sweating on their surface, unless you've got ears like an elephant, 
you won't cool as quickly as a smaller person. For that reason, I often get real hot on a run. In fact, you can see here, I'm one of the few people wearing a t-shirt, but I felt fine. But at the start of a race, stood still, I could be as cold as anybody else. The same if I slow down a lot or pick up an injury. So being able to chuck on, take off and store a long sleeve, especially in the winter, really handy. On the flip side, keeping cool when it's hot is important too, so I'll often carry some water when again others might not be bothering. Although don't get carried away on that one, I've done a separate video on why you probably don't need to carry water on shorter runs. Whizzing around your local park run, you don't need a flask in your hand. 50k, obviously water was essential and a bunch of other things that were needed by anybody of any size running this distance. We had to have nutrition, emergency space blanket, waterproof layers, etc. And I like to use a Solomon vest for that, just like the guy from before. Mine is here. I run in backpacks and they are no way near as good as a decent vest. The ability to distribute the weight and the size of what you're carrying around your body, as opposed to all in the middle of your back, and the ability to get at it on the move from pockets and designed in such a way that nothing rubs, you can't be a good vest. I've got the 12 and five liter version of this. Jen's got the eight liter. They weigh nothing. In fact, sometimes I go running with this just to carry my mobile phone. I can hardly tell I'm wearing it, so why not? And finishing off on kit, don't make the mistake I did when I first started running, which is to wear big baggy clothes. Despite what I used to think, you're not hiding the fact that you are a big person by wearing a triple XL sweatshirt. And running in excess fabric is just stupid. It starts off heavy, it ends up heavier when it's covered in sweat, it bounces about, it rubs in all the wrong places. Just get proper base layers, flat seams, moisture wicking, and then wear lightweight proper kit on top. Ignore what you think you look like, just dress to run, because you're running. Running distance has enough hurdles as it is, don't add poor underwear to the list. So the first 10K of this run went great. I was doing six minute kilometers, perfect pacing for this point in the race. There's a few sections that had to be power walked up, so that requires them picking up the pace to compensate elsewhere, but that was all going fine. Predominantly uphill for the first hour and a half to the highest point on the course, but there are a couple of steep downhill sections as well that were actually quite fun to whiz down. I felt good, I felt fresh. Just over 10K done in a good time. Uh, although this half K to the top of the hill is gonna slow things a bit, but then obviously a good chunk of downhill. Feeling okay. Um, had a gel, feel okay. Legs are tired, but only because of this bit. Um, once I get going downhill, whew, should be okay again. So far, so good. Here's the top and the view. So first 10K, done in one hour, two minutes, and I was feeling good at this point. I had a five target system for this race. Target one, obviously win it, it's a race. It's got to be a target, although it would have required everybody else faster than me to be very poorly on the day. Target two was to go sub five and a half hours. That would have beaten my best ever 50K time, which was the five hours 40 set on that dead flat Thames Path course back in summer 2019. 4,000 feet of climbing on this one meant that was about as likely to be achieved as target one. Target three, go sub six hours, the big one. Perfectly achievable and a real achievement to get. Target four was to beat 2019's six hours two, and target five, if all else failed, was just be above average and finish in the top half. At this point, sub six, definitely on the cards, five and a half hours, and that was at the back of my mind. And on the bottom of my feet, smooth segue, were my ultra lone peak fives, and my second heavy runner tip, the right shoes. Another mistake I made when I started running was buying into this idea that I needed, because I was big and heavy, bouncy, cushioned, supportive shoes prescribed to me following a gait analysis. Now I'm not an expert in this field, so it may well be that that approach does work for everybody else and may therefore work for you. So I'll speak only of my experience. It was a waste of time and money. I had ankle pain, knee pain, shin pain hit. I'd get a pain in my neck going running. And then I discovered minimalist, low cushioned shoes. And I read up on the appropriate way to run, midfoot striking in such footwear as this, and despite jumping straight into these types of shoes at way over 300 pounds, I never had an injury then, haven't had one since. It turned out, and again, perhaps just for me, that millions of years of evolution left me able to run just fine if I wore shoes that let my foot run the way mother nature intended, and not the way Nike's marketing department from 1979 onwards wanted. 
I have a lot of shoes. 99% of them are made by Ultra. Wide toe box, let my feet spread out, and zero drop between heel and toe. I do have Ultra trainers with varying degrees of cushioning, but I only use the higher cushion shoes for running beyond 50K. These, Lone Peak 5s, I can feel twigs and stones beneath my foot. I can tell if I'm slipping, if I'm losing traction. I feel, without sounding like I'm a vegan sandwich away from being a full on Ultra runner, that I'm at one with the terrain I'm crossing. And as somebody that needs to be dropping 100 kilos onto these more than 50,000 times during that run, I won't run into anything else. 15K, just started to rain a little bit. Um, starting to watch the pace as well, now averaging a 620. Um, and having to obviously walk a few bits. Or well, try and hold it sub 630 if I can. Yeah, feeling okay. Um, just a bit mindful of that time and these hills. So race update by 15K, I had descended from the highest point, but then had a pretty tough climb back up again. As a result, my pace had slipped to a 620. Now that is still good enough to go sub five and a half hours, but it's not ideal this early on. On the upside, here is me being incredibly sensible. I mentioned I'd run 100K this year. Big mistake I made in that race was simply not tightening up my shoelaces at around 15, 16K. They'd come a bit loose. I figured I'd sort them out later. By the time I did, around 30K, my foot had moved around inside the shoe so much, I'd wrecked my feet with 70K still to go. I'm still growing back toenails that I lost as a result. Here, I knew I had a reasonable amount of descending to do, which I did in shoes too loose would be very stupid. So annoying though it is to have people going past me, I spent three minutes fixing my laces. And as soon as I came to the first downhill section afterwards, I was glad I'd done so. Now, 20 kilometers coming up, so let me just explain the route. It's an out and back, but with a loop on the end. So around 21 kilometers, there's a food checkpoint, checkpoint two, we veer off and do a seven kilometer loop, during which we obviously go through the halfway point, before coming back to that checkpoint, now called checkpoint three, and picking up the trail to follow it back again. That was a tough 10K. Um, lots of ups and downs, but all of it so steep and slippy that I couldn't get any decent pace up at all. Um, consequently, crashed my average pace to 6.39. It's back to 6.38 now, because I'm picking it up a bit down here. But uh, that is the wrong side of 6.30. Hey, here comes. Awesome running, buddy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a guy that has done the loop and is heading back um, to win fairly um, convincingly because I can't see anybody else following him. Um, that is crazy. That is crazy time. Um, and he had a beard. Typical. I'll give you that guy's finish time at the end. It was absolutely insane. Right, before I started this race, I knew that I wanted to talk about pacing as being the third heavy runner tip. I was hoping that this race might highlight pace better than it did in the end. My hope was that I could correct the huge screw up that I'd made in that 100 kilometer race I did, where what I should have done was taken the target time that I had, calculate the pace required to achieve it, and then run a bit faster at the start in order to allow for slowing down a bit towards the end, but not too fast. What I actually did on that run was go way too fast at the beginning and then came close to passing out in the pitch black while running in a field alongside a river at night, falling and drowning. So I did do that calculation for this race. The trouble is the extreme variations in terrain here meant that my pace was being dictated by the severity of the hills I was going up and down or the mud I was wading through rather than a choice on my part. In fact, the mud in places here, especially on the looped section was ridiculous. So I was struggling to walk parts of it, let alone run it at any sort of pace. So ignore what I did here. But pace is important. Aside from shoes and running style, the thing that impacted my ability to run while heavy, and still pretty heavy, without physical repercussions, was simply running slow and consistent. Going too fast, or going too fast, and then having to back off, that led to me having issues. The minute I slowed down and tried to run at a steady, consistent pace, I started being able to run faster. Even now, if I go out and run a steady, quick 10K training run at, say, a 4.30 pace, with a kilometer to go, if I think, oh, I can smash out the last kilometer in a 3.45 or something, 
The next day I'll have ankle pain, fatigue, that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Sometimes that's worth it, end of a race, what the hell. But day to day runs nice and steady. Even when I try and run quick, I make sure my pace, my cadence, it all stays consistent. My Garmin watch, I have all sorts of data displayed during a run, but pace is the most prominent on there. I can still remember my early attempts at running where I'd literally run as fast as I could, which was incredibly slowly, to a lamppost and then walk three lampposts before repeating. I then turn up at a park run on a Saturday morning. I'd have no idea how I was ever gonna get my time close to 30 minutes, let alone under 30. I'd go home in my triple XL sweatshirt feeling very sad. I should have just trained at a much slower, steadier pace. And don't think that running slow and steady means you'll only ever run slow and steady. In 2018 and early 19, I tried over and over to get my 5K park run, which had improved massively, down to close to 20 minutes. Couldn't do it. I was doing sprints, fast kilometers, all sorts of drills. In the end, I gave up. I just focused on doing those two ultras. And then January 1st, 2020, I went and did my first park run in months. I only did it because my New Year's Eve plans had fallen apart when the kids phoned us two hours after we checked into our incredibly expensive London hotel for a fancy pants night out, and they said the dog was sick. So we had to go home. Dog wasn't even that sick. Anyway, next morning, four weeks after doing the Hurtwood 50, 2019, I did my park run in 1938. Run slow, get fast. And the dog wasn't that sick. Complete overreaction, morons. Just gone through 25K, two hours 52. This course has proven to be brutal this year. Um, very so wet and cold. It is not going to plan here. Anyway, let's talk about fueling. Heavier runners, need more fuel than lighter runners. Simple physics. More energy is needed to move 100 kilos than 50 kilos, assuming they're both going the same distance for the same time. In fact, it annoys Jen a lot because we'll go out for a jog and we'll get back and she'll be exhausted. I won't have broken into a sweat. And yet on Garmin, she'll be told that she's burnt 300 calories and mine will be saying 700. The downside of your weight causing more calorie consumption over longer runs is your body needs more calories to operate and running and consuming them is a bit of a skill that you have to practice and find what works for you. Over the years, I've settled on eating well the night before a long run so I can get away with a very light breakfast and then nibbling from one hour onwards. In this race, that's exactly what I did. A bagel with peanut butter and chocolate chips at 7 a.m. started my run at 9.30 and then started on the nutrition that I carried from 10.30 onwards. And I'm now able to eat and run and feel okay. When I first started running over two hours, I'd feel ill eating. So I tried not eating, and I'd feel even more ill. So I then tried eating a little on runs where I didn't need to eat. I'd go and do a 10K and eat at 5K, half flapjack or something, and just built it up. Here, every 45 minutes after the first hour, I made sure I ate something, even if I didn't feel hungry. Your brain is not always a good guide to your food needs. I've tried listening to my brain before and I've ended up passing out in the street. Of course, the other side is don't fall into the trap of thinking that because you went out and jogged 10K for an hour, you can come home and eat a huge pizza. When I got home from this run, I did eat a huge pizza. So that's a bad example. Maybe that's a good example because despite running for a very long time here and a very long way at a very heavy weight, the pizza and the accompanying snacks that I consumed in the evening way exceeded the calories that I had burned. Bottom line, be aware that no matter how much energy you expend, you can eat it back easily. I also ate half of Jen's pizza because she burns less calories than me, whatever she's doing, so simple physics again. Okay, just gone through 30K, I'm off. Um, slipped the wrong side of seven minute pace. This next 10K, is the grim one too far to go still to get excited about finishing but gone hell of a long way on this terrain so i'm exhausted um get this done and then uh, and then focus on that last 10 downhill push it get myself back under seven and sub six so at 30k this is going pear-shaped. Seven minute pace brings me in just under six hours. My hope was that I could average that for the remainder of the run, but there were just so many ups and downs, literally. In fact, the feature of this run is that you are hardly ever running on level ground for more than a minute or so. And you might think that that's good, the downhills are fast, so they'll cancel out the uphills. And on some courses that works but not here. The downhills were steep and slippery in the wet and the mud, which meant it was impossible to go down them quickly. So they were actually slow. In fact, in some cases, slower than going up the hills. So on flat ground, I could run just fine. I felt okay. But as I said, there just wasn't much of it. 
40 k. Four hours 55 gives me one hour five to run 10 k. 10k to go, one hour five to do it. Normally an hour five to do 10k should be a jog in the park, but I could remember hitting 40k last time. Four hours 50, which gives me over an hour to get the last 10k done. So I am five minutes behind where I was in 2019, and I missed sub six back then. And the problem this time is it is so much tougher going. Last time the downhill sections were almost playful to do. I was able to go down them with a bit of pace, and use them to make up some lost time. It was actually fun to run down. This time, I was crawling down those slopes and just to avoid ending up on my backside. There was a moment about 6K left when a guy came past me with a proper ultra runner beard, like I could see it from behind. I thought this is a sign, follow the beard. The ultra runner beard will guide me home. It's like it's been sent by the granola gods. Then we came to a hill and he stopped for a rest, so I had to overtake him. Anyway, last heavy runner tip. Of all the things I did, and still do now and then, that made the biggest difference to my running in every sense, lost some weight. Don't get me wrong, you can be as heavy as you like, as fat as you like, as positive about how you feel about that as you like, but you'll be slower than if you were lighter. You may not wanna be faster, that's cool, cause you won't be. So just bear it in mind, I've run at 330 pounds, I've run at 210 pounds, and I can assure you, I can't run as fast at 330 pounds. I ran here at 220, and I was slower than if I'd been 210. There is a fit at any size movement that exists, and to avoid upsetting or offending anybody, I'll again speak only of myself. I was not fit at any size. When I'd been running for six months, I was way fitter than before I started, but I was not fit and healthy, because I was still way too heavy. I could have been as positive about my new 260 pound weight as I liked. It wouldn't have made being that fat good for me. No more than being positive about smoking would have made that a good thing for me either. Now there is a line that we all draw where we decide enough is enough. I'm happy with this size. This year, I drew that line at 220. I said this will do for this race. 210 would have been better, but 220 would do. That's my line. Could be lighter, screw it, donuts. And I'm happy that the only implications of that were minor. I'm often told that lifting weights and eating accordingly means that even 210 is too much weight. Under 200, I'm told, that'll make you faster at cycling and running. I don't care. I've drawn the line way the right side of fit and healthy already. But there was a time when I tried telling myself that at 250, 260, when I was doing 25, 26 minute park runs, that was a good point. Stop dropping weight. I'm now a runner. That's good enough. No, it wasn't. Not for me. Again, don't misunderstand. Be whatever size you want to be. Just be honest about the implications of it. If you want to be a weight that is not good for you, possibly, as it would have been for me, a weight dangerous to stay at, you should be as free to do so as the guys that go and jump off mountains in wingsuits. You might even find that maintaining your weight is more fun than they have flying through the air. I know that I enjoy Big Macs way more than I would have done squeezing myself into a triple XL flying squirrel suit. But I also know that if I was still that weight now and had a heart attack today, people would react to that the way they do when base jumpers fly into a wall. They'd be very, very sad, but they would not be very, very surprised. The last five kilometers of this run had these stupid climbs that on the run out had just been these short blasts down that I didn't even notice. Now, five and a half hours in, going back up them, it felt like climbing mountains. It wasn't until 2K to go that it just became a steady descent back to town. At this point, I know I'm not gonna win. I'm not getting sub five and a half, I'm not getting sub six, I'm not even gonna beat 2019. All I can do is to make sure I don't get overtaken in the last few minutes to maintain some self-respect and hope I'm in the top half. As I said before, I felt okay to run. Once the going was good, I picked up the pace just fine. My last kilometer of the whole race was easily my fastest kilometer of the whole race. Last few hundred meters, there's two people I can see in front of me. I get the first chap, and then the second guy, I wait to 150 meters, then push the last bit. Nicely done. <laughs> well done. And done. And results. Actually, first the guy that won. Four hours, one minute. Bonkers. I was six hours, six minutes. 101 out of 237. Nine didn't finish. Top half, just. Interestingly, my split time from checkpoint two to three, which was the same checkpoint at the start and finish of the loop, was an hour, which was about 132nd. 
So that muddy loop slowed me up a lot and pretty much was what did me in. I've mentioned this before on a wet Spartan race I did, so this sounds like a recurring excuse. Wet mud hills, worst combination for a bigger runner. Dry hills, fine. Flat mud, fine. Anything I can just straight line, like a steamroller, I'm okay. But the minute I've got 100 kilograms of unstable, slipping and sliding human going downhill to deal with, I'm toast. Just the smallest slip that sends me two inches the wrong way, that seems inconsequential, but it just adds up. It needs to be corrected, almost without thinking, but by muscles needing to stabilize and then get me back on course. On over thousands of slips for hours on end, fatigue sets in. Heavy and fast is fine, I just can't zigzag too well. On the upside, my recovery was good. Garmin body battery had me at high physical stress after the run until bedtime, then steady recovery all night. Monday felt really good, chest day in the gym, no real stiffness. My aura ring tracked sleep as being good that night, apart from being restless for the first couple of hours and then good after that. That could have been the pizza as much as the run. Today, it's Tuesday, back to 100%. Gonna be doing a 5K later, got a gym session tonight, might even go on Zwift. Big question, I suppose, is could I have got sub six if four weeks ago I'd stuck to the original plan? Yeah, I think I probably could have done. Carrying an extra 10 pounds did not help, but donuts. I'll get it next year. Okay, hope you enjoyed it. Got any questions, got any feedback? As always, stick it down below and please like and subscribe because that is worth way more to me than any race results. And I also met a few people on that race who said they watched the YouTube channel. So if that was one of you, let me know that in the comments too. And if you're a heavier runner, perhaps even heavier than me and you ran it, definitely stick that down below because that is awesome to hear about. Big people getting out, doing big distances. Love it. And if you're heavier than me and you beat me, shut up. Don't know that. I'll delete that comment. I'm kidding, but I will delete that comment.